My name is Sister Rita Hickey, and I'm a Poor Clare. The official name of the Poor Clares is the Sisters of St. Clare, Second Order of the Franciscan Order. Um, I have been a Poor Clare for about 27 years, but I have been a sister since I was 17. And I was an active sister. I was the Sister of Charity of St. Elizabeth. That's not a daughter of charity. It's a Sister of Charity like Mother Seton founded. I really can't say that I ever seriously thought about being anything else. I, I can remember certain moments in um, my childhood growing up when I was very aware of wanting to be a sister. One of them was when I was about seven or eight years old, maybe even younger. My grandmother had a sister who was a sister of St. Joseph. She was a very dignified woman, Sister St. Andrew. We never called her anything but sister in her presence, but when she wasn't there, she was Aunt Lizzie. And she wanted to go to Convent Station, which is in New Jersey, where I am from, to the mother house of the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth to visit someone. And my uncle was going to drive her. And my uncle Marty was the shining star of my life. He was just the, for my first love. And any place he went, I went. So he took me, and we drove Aunt Lizzie to see the friend at the Sisters of Charity of Mother House. And he kept me busy by picking up pine cones and telling me all the things we could make out of pine cones while she was inside visiting her friend. And I can remember standing and looking up through the pine trees at the building and thinking, I'm coming back here. And I did. I went back there to go to high school. I asked, I wanted to go to the academy there. I wanted to be there with the sisters. So I went as a boarder. Uh, it was about maybe an hour and a half away from my home. So I was home frequently, but I did go as a boarder, and I absolutely loved it. And one other thing that happened to me when I was about the same age as this incident with the pine cones was that the sister who taught me in school, who was one of these sisters in charity, Sister Margaret Arnina, I know now she was very, very young, but of course then I thought she was ancient. In the third grade, she read us the life of St. Catherine Laboure. And part of that, who was a sister of charity, a daughter of charity, and in part of that life, she said that her mother, who died when she was quite young, had taught her that every night before she went to bed, she should say three Hail Marys that God would reveal to her what he wanted her to do with her life. So I started doing that. And I was pretty faithful to it from the time I was about in the third grade. So when I finished high school at Convent, I entered the community. And something began to happen after I entered. I kept thinking back to growing up in a Carmelite parish back in New Jersey. And I kept thinking about the little flower. And I kept thinking that I would rather be that kind of a sister than an active sister. And I started telling people, and I sort of got patted on the hat, on the head, and told that, oh, everybody thinks they want to run off and be the little flower. You're a good student, and you're going to be a wonderful teacher. And I loved these sisters because I had been with them all my life. And so I just went ahead with everything. I made my vows. I did my studying. And I went out and taught. And the first, I was only in one school for the first several years of my teaching career. And while I was there, the word went out for the mother house looking for sisters to volunteer for the home missions, the Caribbean missions, and the South American missions. So I volunteered. My local superior was very annoyed with me, <laughs> but I did it. And lo and behold, I got picked. But not for the dramatic Bolivia or the Virgin Islands. I was going to Pensacola, Florida, to an inner city segregated school for black American children. And while I was there, I got very much caught up in the civil rights movement, um, even to the point of getting in trouble with the law. I was very, very much with the civil rights movement, very, very interested in it. And 
it was good, but it was also bad because during that time I began being less concerned about praying and my personal relationship with God, which is not, I'm not saying that this is because I was a sister. Don't misunderstand me. These were really good prayerful sisters, but this was happening to me. And the church was changing and the civil rights movement was going on and it was just bedlam everywhere. And I said to myself, why can't I just be like my mother? Why can't I just lead a, a really ordinary Catholic life and, and be done with it? And about the same time, I got involved with charismatic renewal. And I looked at all those lay people around me and I said, why am I bothering with this? And I left. I got dispensed from my vows and I got a job teaching in Mobile, Alabama at the local Catholic high school. And later I went and taught at uh, Spring Hill College. And I was very happy. I had a wonderful time. I did a lot of the things that I hadn't done when I was growing up because I had never had a job in my own home and my own car and all that business and now I had it. And I had a great time and I was still a good Catholic woman. And Spring Hill decided to offer a master's degree in theology. And I decided to be part of taking it. And I met a priest there and asked to go to confession to him and find myself telling him I had a contemplative vocation and I was so sorry I was too old to do anything about it, much to my surprise. And he said, no, you're not. He said, you're not too young, too old to... to uh, go into a contemplative community. And to make a long story short, I ended up with the poor Clares on Henry Clay and Magazine. They gave me a chance to come and try my vocation, and I never left. I have been there ever since. Um, I, this p community that I belong to, is, I think, is a particularly wonderful one because it's very simple. Um, the story of St. Clair and her order is very complicated in many ways. She founded a community under the direction of St. Francis, but a different kind of life than he was living. In fact, I heard a, um, a sister from Italy describe it this way. She said, if Francis was Jesus back on the dusty roads of the world, then Claire was the son of God, and I get emotional every time I say this, who never left the bosom of the father. And gradually, St. Clair had to write her own rule. She was the first woman who ever did this. And it wasn't until she was dying that it was approved. And it happened to be approved at the time because the Pope was in Perugia, which was a city right next to Assisi, and got a cop was sent a copy of it, and hand wrote the approval of her rule without putting it through all the steps it's supposed to go through. And this was at a time when uh, after the, uh, the council, the Lateran council, uh, he ha the Pope had said, nobody is to write any more rules. We've got enough. Take a, a version of what's out there. It's, but she did it, you know. And it wasn't that she was disobedient to the Pope. She was very respectful of of the church and very much a Catholic, but she felt called to do this and submitted it to him. And he finally approved it on her deathbed. Brought it, the uh, young monk brought it back, ran from Perugia to Assisi with this copy, and she died holding it, thanking God that it had been approved. But it was lost, that copy of the rule. And even during her lifetime, there were women in monasteries hearing about Claire, decided they wanted to live her kind of a life rather than the kind of life that most women were living in monasteries then, which were big uh, organizations with farms and all kinds of things associated to them. And so they would just imitate her as best they could. So there were all kinds of people around who were calling themselves followers of St. Clair, and they weren't organized at all. It wasn't until the 19th century that that original rule was found again and Pope Pius IX wanted to restart it. And he couldn't restart it in, 
Italy or France or Germany because there were so many different kinds of poor clairs, each one with their own rule at this time. So he sent two sisters, who were sisters, who were poor clairs, to the United States. And one of them was the founder of our monastery, Mother um, Madeline Bentamoglio. She was an Italian countess. So the, our roots go back from her to Claire directly. And so we lead a, a very simple life. It's built around prayer. We don't do anything extraordinary except work always on the witness of our prayer and our living together in community. We consider that our vocation. It's twofold, not just prayer, although that's so important, our personal prayer and our liturgical prayer, which we say together every day, five or six times a day, but also our personal relationship with Jesus because we believe that each of us is a word of God which is to be spoken before the whole hymn of the universe can be sung. And that's how we see our vocation, and that's how we see the vocation of our sisters. So our calling is to live a life of prayer in community, in witness to the body of Christ, the value of every human being, and the importance of prayer.